So we're all familiar with this. Uh, have I got hypertension? What do I do about it? OMG. Um, not another guideline talk. Um, so confusing. And even worse, it's about blood pressure. So um, a lot has happened in, in the blood pressure space in the last few years. There's been um, more sets of guidelines than you can count on two hands. And a huge amount of confusion surrounds um, the treatment of hypertension or even what hypertension is and what the definition of hypertension is. And so it's no wonder that um, the people at the coalface are confused and, uh, and the recommendations seem to keep on coming out uh, thick and fast with, with um, uh, little cognizance of how difficult that might be to manage in practice. Um, some of the guidelines have very relaxed um, uh, sort of parameters and some much more stringent, in fact, which uh, it almost means that um, most of the older population are labelled as hypertensive. So, so this is the most recent um, clinical practice guideline, or one of them, that I, I want to really uh, alert you to. And um, it is a very, very comprehensive document. It came out um, actually early this year um, with a large number of organizations, but particularly the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. So this is really the Bible that you would say now is, uh, is um, guiding uh, hypertension um, in most uh, parts of, of the developed world anyway. And the key recommendations, I mean, it's it's 122 pages, so um, don't expect me to, to go through that, but I'm, I expect you all to download it after the session and read it tonight. Um, uh, but it's fantastic bedtime reading, but it's really around the uh, accurate measurement of blood pressure and the accurate definition of blood pressure. Um, the emphasis on uh, not doing a one-off measurement, but uh, more, than, more than or equal to two readings on two occasions. So just really taking out some key points. And um, in, in our modern world, uh, access to home monitoring now is very, very widespread, and I'm sure you're seeing that with, um, with all your patients, and you've probably uh, also ambulatory blood pressure, pressure monitoring, and um, I'm not sure how many of you are, are lending blood pressure monitors uh, to patients or encouraging them to get blood pressure monitors, but there's an increasing recognition of the use of, of uh, home monitoring and out-of-office monitoring, and how does that relate to what you're seeing in your surgery? Um, white coat hypertension is alive and well. It's very, very uh, common, and it's important to make, uh, to make that diagnosis. But there's also the concept of masked hypertension, where people are actually hypertensive in their everyday life, but they've been sitting in your waiting room for half an hour. It's the only time they get to relax during the week, and in fact, their blood pressure is a lot lower than it is in their daily life. So making an accurate diagnosis around the type of hypertension. The, the key here is that, in fact, the lifetime risk in, in, um, is, is extremely high. The lifetime risk of hypertension across all ethnic groups is extremely high. Uh, at the age of 40, uh, if you live another 40 years, you've got about a 95% chance of becoming hypertensive, but it really depends on the definition. But there is a, a gradation of risk uh, from a blood pressure of around a 115 over 70. It just keeps on going up. It used to be thought there was a J-shaped curve, but there, that has now been shown with really uh, pretty robust meta-analyses that that's not the case. And so um, for every 20 millimeter mercury increase in systolic blood pressure or 10 millimeter of diastolic, the risk of a cardiovascular disease event uh, doubles. Um, and conversely, uh, a reduction of 10 millimetres of mercury in systolic blood pressure, which is not a huge amount, gives you quite a big bang for the buck, 20% uh, relative risk reduction in cardiovascular disease over, over the next five years. But of course, um, the absolute risk reduction or absolute benefit really depends on the, um, on the, on the risk uh, profile of the patient. So the greater the absolute risk, the greater the absolute benefit in terms of blood pressure reduction. But it is a very important risk factor and we do need to look at that. Um, it talks about the importance of screening and management of other cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah. These usually go hand in hand, as you all know, and um, it's an additive or multiplicative uh, situation. So it's incredibly important just to treat all risk factors, not just hypertension in isolation and screening for secondary causes is very important. <clears throat> and these uh, generally only around 5% of uh, hypertensive, will, uh, hypertensive will have a secondary cause, but if that can be found then that can be very beneficial. 
and a huge emphasis or a greater emphasis on non-pharmacologic in interventions and I know in your practices you'll be dealing with this all the time it's often a bit of a bit of a nightmare but uh, small changes can make a big difference so uh, we shouldn't ignore uh, the benefit of weight loss sodium or salt restriction which is um, pretty prevalent uh, high salt uh, in, 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 our, um, in our foods, potassium rich foods, particularly fruit and vegetables, uh, regular exercise and alcohol reduction. So, um, <clears throat> sorry. so without more ado, case one. So Ropata has hypertension for the last 10 years. He's been on a combination of salazapril 2.5 and chlorothaladone 25, uh, good treatment. Um, but he's had some episodes of gout recently. One was triggered by seafood, but the others with no obvious cause. He's a non-insulin dependent diabetic and his uh, HbA1c has gone from 52 to 55 recently. Um, and his weight's actually gone up from 97 to 100 as well. When he sees you, his blood pressure is usually 150 to 60 over 95. Uh, but he's got a home, well, it's, it's actually his wife's home blood pressure monitor, and he's been using it um, occasionally. And he's tells you he's getting readings of 130 to 140 over 85. He's got sleep apnea, but he doesn't like using the mask. Um, and he doesn't want to take more pills. So how would you proceed? Well, you've got 10 minutes to sort Ropata out, and you've got a whole heap of questions, of course. Um, and this really underscores the complexity of hypertension, even though you're seeing it all day, every day. There's, it's, it's a very multifaceted uh, problem, and there are a huge number of uh, inputs uh, that you need into um, uh, to knowing about Ropata um, before you can make a decision. Uh, obviously, one of the most important is how old is he? So we all know blood pressure goes up with age, and um, that will have a very significant effect on how aggressively you want to manage his hypertension. Um, but we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, what is his intake of alcohol, caffeine, salt? How much exercise does he do? Is he a smoker? How long has he been a diabetic? Um, does he have evidence of uh, end organ damage with uh, renal disease and albuminuria? What's his cholesterol level? How often has his blood pressure been measured? How can you, uh, can, can we be very confident about these uh, readings? And importantly, he says his blood pressure is lower at home. How is he measuring it? Um, how often is he taking it? When is he taking it at home? How compliant is he? What other medications is he taking? He's just had some gout. Uh, and he has actually been uh, taking some um, uh, Voltaren, uh, which he has um, got from the pharmacy. He's been taking it quite regularly recently. <clears throat> and why is the difference between surgery and home blood pressure measurement? So you're thinking of all of these, but the underlying fact is, you know, what's the cause of hypertension here <clears throat> in Ropata? He is diabetic. Uh, he's got a degree of nephropathy. Uh, and he's also been hypertensive for some time. So those are likely, uh, the renal dysfunction uh, is uh, likely to be a cause. And in fact, his creatinine is 110, his EGFR is 55. So he's got mild renal impairment, he's got microalbuminuria, and he's probably got um, uh, both a degree of hypertensive and diabetic nephropathy. Importantly, what should his target blood pressure be? How should we monitor this? And what would the effects of um, lifestyle modification, so losing weight, salt restriction, um, doing some more exercise, reducing his coffee and alcohol, and he has been drinking a fair bit lately. And what's his risk? So that's really important. If we're really going to go after treating his uh, hypertension aggressively, well, is it worth it? So if we put him into a risk assessment calculator, he's actually 56 years old. He's had diabetes for five years. Um, he was a smoker up until five years ago. Um, and he is a Maori male, um, and his systolic blood pressure there, 150, his cholesterol, 6.5. Um, his risk is very high, 23%. So uh, he's, he's at high risk of a cardiovascular event over the next five years, and a 9% risk of a heart attack. So there's a no, no question here that he is at high risk of a cardiovascular event, and we need to get his blood pressure under good control. So what is, in 2018, what is hypertension? So this, um, this guideline recommendation now from, the, uh, from these joint colleges is that um, 
normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80. Now, across a population, that means that a vast number of people have abnormal blood pressure. Elevated blood pressure, 120 to 130 over uh, 80, and stage one hypertension, 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. So, so one take home message is that the thresholds for diagnosing hypertension have certainly come down uh, in recognition of the increased burden of risk that that um, confers. However, more and more people are going to be labelled as having hypertension. <clears throat> So um, there's been another recent um, guideline come out, which I'm sure you're all uh, aware of. This is the uh, recent update of the cardiovascular guidelines that's been put out by the Ministry of Health with input from a number of, number of people. Some of you may have been involved <clears throat> for, and I think this takes a lot of the, the global information, particularly these more stringent uh, recommendations, and puts it into some uh, good perspective. Um, and I would encourage you to read that document, which isn't 122 pages, but it's about 30 pages, and that's, it's very good. But it talks about um, what's the difference between uh, home monitoring and office monitoring, and there's, there's, it's, it's well recognised that there's a small difference between uh, office readings and home readings, uh, particularly um, with the um, different techniques of, of using a sphygmo versus a oscillometric technique as well. Um, but that needs to be taken into account. But in terms of diagnosis of white coat hypertension, uh, a, it's a very useful um, tool is to do home monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Um, <clears throat> so treatment recommendations that really come out of of these guidelines and that are relevant to Ropata is that the greater the CVD risk, the greater the benefit. And so he is unequivocally going to be uh, benefiting from trying to get his blood pressure to below 130 over 80. Um, if, he, if there's an intermediate risk uh, then, and the blood pressure is above 140 over 90, uh, the suggestion is that one should have a, an individualised discussion and, and target uh, lifestyle intervention and then uh, try and uh, get blood pressure down. Um, but if it doesn't uh, come down, then uh, uh, pharmacological therapy and, uh, to get below 130 over 80. Over 160 over 100, um, blood pressure treatment should be uh, instituted regardless uh, of cardiovascular risk. But then, of course, there's the downside and hypotension, syncope, and falls, particularly in old people. And trying to get a 70-plus-year-old uh, person's blood pressure down to below 130 over 80, as you all know, is highly uh, problematic, and we'll come on to that a little bit. But in terms of lifestyle modification, there's absolutely no question. There's very, very good uh, and strong randomised data that all of these um, uh, interventions, weight loss, uh, uh, heart healthy diet, sodium restriction, potassium supplementation with diet and increased activity and alcohol reduction all help. So Ropata, in my opinion, uh, needs to really try and uh, improve his um, um, uh, risk factors in his, his diet in terms of um, uh, the salt intake, which is quite high alcohol and uh, lack of exercise. I mean, here's the metabolic syndrome, and the mainstay of therapy for that is uh, lifestyle. One can expect reasonable reductions in blood pressure from all of those interventions. And um, <clears throat> then in terms of treatment, um, again, a complex area, but chlorthalidone is the preferred um, diuretic. It's got a long half-life, a proven reduction in CV risk. Um, first line therapy would be calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, or AR, angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, they should not be used in combination angiotensin receptor and ACE inhibitor. And one has to have uh, caution in people with renal impairment. The goal blood pressure for him is less than 130 over 80. And again, as I said, the metabolic syndrome, um, very important um, uh, lifestyle factors. Non steroidals are bad news. Uh, for people with um, renal impairment, uh, hypertension, and who are on ACE inhibitors, so absolutely should be avoided. <clears throat> His gout needs to be brought under control, of course, uh, otherwise he's going to want to go and do that again. So what happened? It was a happy ending. Um, well, he stopped eating shellfish and salty snacks, and he, had a, he was having a high sodium diet. He stopped using Voltaren. He stopped drinking during the week. He started walking every day. He lost three kilos and has, was monitoring his blood pressure regularly. Do you believe me? Yeah. 
But you, you, were, you convinced him, and he absolutely did. And, <laughs> and his blood pressure um, did come down, and he's continued to monitor that at home. Um, now, are you happy with that? Um, do you believe that? Uh, that's the question for lunchtime. But um, he, the point here is that with uh, taking out some of those factors that were really precipitating his blood pressure, his blood pressure did come under better control. And, and those are relatively achievable. <clears throat> However, intensification of therapy, uh, particularly with increasing the ACE inhibitor to a full dose of Slazbrill to five, would be also um, the right thing to do as well to try and get his blood pressure down, monitoring his renal function. So. So that really looks a little bit around um, new recommendations for thresholds for treatment, definition of hypertension, use of uh, home monitoring, etc. It's a vast area. <clears throat> um, uh, Rupert, uh, on the other hand, is a 45-year-old male, highly stressful job. He goes out for lunch uh, and drinks a fair amount of wine three uh, or more times a week. He's not doing any exercise. He's on the go the whole time. He can't sleep properly. And he reads the New York Times every day. And he's recently read an article that his blood pressure should be 120 over 70. And why isn't it? Because it's 130 over 85. And I'm really worried about that. And I need some tablets now. So can you please give me the tablets so my blood pressure can get down to 120 over 70? Thanks. So, um, this is the article he read, um, <clears throat> as, as you do in the New York Times, um, the um, SPRINT trial, so a, 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 pivotal, a pivotal trial that really sort of put the cat amongst the pigeons, but an important piece of evidence, nearly 10,000 people were uh, taken, but they were mainly males and they were in their late 60s and they all had an increased cardiovascular risk. They weren't diabetic, but they had an increased risk. And they were randomized to a very intensive strategy of blood pressure lowering to below 120 or um, a uh, <coughs> standardized therapy of 130. And looking at these primary outcome measures of heart attacks and stroke and death from cardiovascular cause. And it certainly showed that you could keep, you can keep people's blood pressure down for forever if you want and if you if you if those people are compliant so an average of three medications in the um, intensive arm versus two in the in the standard and there was a risk reduction there was a 25 percent relative risk reduction of um, major events over a three and a half year period but only a 0.5 percent reduction absolute reduction but there that was at the expense of an, uh, an increased risk of as you'd expect of hypotension syncope kidney injury, electrolyte disturbance, but uh, not falls that cause injury. So if you look at the number needed to treat in a population like that, uh, to save one of the primary outcome events, it was 61. To save one death, it was 90. And to save a cardiovascular death, 172 people had to be treated for one year to save one event. Um, but the number needed to, to um, uh, cause, the number treated that would have a adverse event was actually less than that, was 46. So a very controversial trial in terms of how low should we try and push uh, blood pressure. If we look at Rupert's uh, cardiovascular risk, he's at low intermediate risk at the moment, being a 45-year-old male with no other real risk factors. And the mainstay here is, is lifestyle changes and significant, importantly, reduction of alcohol and increasing exercise. Um, he should he worry about his blood pressure at the moment? Um, blood pressure goes up with age, um, <clears throat> and this is uh, by Maselli, who's a sort of guru of hypertension, um, who's got a more pragmatic approach, and if, if you really want to know what a person's target blood pressure, systolic blood pressure should be, his rule of thumb is 100 plus half the systolic, um, <coughs> uh, 100 um, plus the age divided by two. So if you're, if you're 40, then it's 120. If you're 80, it's 140. And that, I think, is quite a realistic and good rule of thumb uh, in terms of target blood pressures, uh, systolic blood pressures. And so his editorial, I think, is really um, very appropriate, and that is that um, the um, very few who preach rarely treat. Uh, those few who teach more only sometimes treat, and those who treat do not always listen, neither to those who preach. 
uh, nor to those who teach. So um, <laughs> it's a difficult area, it's confusing. Um, there are new targets which are much more stringent, but the important thing is target those at high cardiovascular risk because the greater the risk, the greater the absolute benefit of treatment. Um, lifestyle factor is incredibly important and this concept of home monitoring and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. I think I've probably gone over time. Cool. Sorry about that. Oh, it doesn't mean you escape questions. Sorry. <laughs> um, so thanks for sending the questions in. There's, there's quite a few. Unfortunately, we can't go through all of them. Right. But the common theme is about anti-inflammatory use. Um, there's about three or four questions about this. So there's uh, one question about you know, someone who's hypertensive, if, if they've got pain, the impact of taking an NSAID on their blood pressure and you know, chronicity and also the impact on renal function. This guy's on an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic and he's taking an anti-inflammatory and obviously that may impact on um, renal function uh, as well and you know, could you use prednisone for his gout? So do you have any? Uh, I mean, it's a difficult situation. I'm sure you, you have to manage it far more than we do, but we, we see people uh, who are referred with hypertension and, and a relatively common theme is, is, is quite significant non-steroidal use as well and um, kidney damage. So th they are bad agents and if they can be avoided, especially in people with evidence of early renal disease who are going to be on an angiotensin, uh, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, I think they're really to be avoided and um, you know, gout can be managed by other um, means. 